I am. Um, I'm very excited to be moderating this e uh, this event here tonight. Um, we all know who we're here to see, right? <laughs> did you guys do your homework and read the book? <laughs> I, I I did as well. <laughs> I not only read it, I also listened to it in audiobook. Did anyone do that? Yeah, it's, it's a gift because she is also a musician. Do you guys know that? Yeah. Um, I just want to, I'm just really excited to uh, have this conversation with her. We've been chatting backstage, having a ball. Um, Michelle Zauner is not only the author of uh, Crying in H Mart, she's adapting it for uh, the screen as well. <laughs> And it, not only that, but she's also a kick-ass musician uh, for a band called Japanese Breakfast. <laughs> so you, if you want to just like keep that energy going and welcome her to the stage, Michelle Zellner. Hey! <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, First things first, uh, have you been to the H-Mart here in Chicago? Uh, I haven't, actually. I think I was thinking about taking an Uber there for lunch, but I didn't. <laughs> I didn't make it. <laughs> okay, then I also have to ask, are you, like, do you have a lifetime coupon to H-Mart? 15% uh, off? I wish. You would <laughs> think that that would have been offered to me by now. Okay, this is going out onto the internet. Mr. But, Mr. Mart? Yeah. What's going on? You know on? how Koreans yeah. are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They, uh, she's saying they're cheap. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you about all of this. I'm, I'm actually divvied up the questions by uh, category. The first one is called identity. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to really, well, first of all, I was really struck inside of the book. Um, with your relationship to your Koreanness, because it's not only incredibly intimate, um, it's very private, right? And by virtue of like, I'm, if there are any Asian people here, <laughs> and if you grew up in the Midwest, you have the same sort of like, we grew up in this very white space as well. So your relationship to your Asianness is like somewhat distant and also incredibly intimate, right? Um, but at this point, being touring and having written this book, um, and having to address your Asianness all the time, uh, how has that changed? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I I think that it's it's hard to know how much of it is rooted in um, my work and how much of it has just changed uh, with the times and my age. You know, I mean, I think that it's all kind of happening simultaneously. I mean, I feel very comfortable with my identity, and I think that that started to happen as I just became more comfortable with who I was as, as a person. You know, when you're a teenager, uh, anything that sort of sets you apart from the group is uh, horrifying and embarrassing. And so I think at the time growing up in a city with very little diversity, it was um, just felt like a, like a scab, you know, something to, to sort of keep hidden. And so I think it's just, uh, I've just gotten more comfortable with age and, you know, it's a really wonderful thing to bring a community of people um, who've also had some struggles with that sort of thing uh, that come together around your work. And yeah, so it's, it's definitely changed a lot and I feel very comfortable and, and confident in who I am now. Um, so having grown up in like kind of a generally white space, uh, you don't have access to like the Korean community and all this stuff, like I understand that. Um, and especially because you guys weren't necessarily plugged into the Christian, like Korean church scene. Um, can I ask, what do you think was great about that? <laughs> like, about not being a part not of it? Not being a part of it. Because of like the there church? are parts of it, like, because you weren't... Because there are parts of it that are incredibly freeing. Like when I was growing up, like the fact that I was not a part of that meant that I didn't have as much scrutiny being heaped right. on me by yeah, yeah, yeah. Korean ajumas and like For aunties sure. at the church, you know? Um, no, uh, no golf dads and yeah. Lexuses. Yeah. I mean, I think that my only regret is like, uh, you know, th that there, there, there isn't a, like a, a profound understanding of like allegory that, you know, comes with just going to church. But right. um, <laughs> I think that, 
You know, I mean, I mean, I really appreciate. I mean, I don't, I don't think I would have survived. I don't know. I yeah. mean, uh, I, I was so uh, independent that I, I don't think, you know, I would have, I would have handled it well. I mean, I, I'm glad that um, I went to Hangul Hokkyo, which was like at the Presbyterian Church uh, every Friday. At the time, I was not glad yeah. about it. <laughs> um, because most Korean kids have to go to Korean school on a Friday or a Saturday, which is uh, a nightmare. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, but I, 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 I mean, I, I wish I had uh, studied harder and, and learned Korean during that time. I mean, it was like a good thing to be like, kind of exposed to because it was such a small community. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad. I'm, I'm mostly just really proud of my mom. Like, I don't think that I realized um, what a courageous thing that was to walk away from, you know, to be in a small town uh, and one of the only Korean women, um, you know, and and to walk away from your own community because you don't uh, sort of subscribe to that set of, of belief. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it, when I was that age, when, when we kind of removed ourselves from it, I thought it was so profound, but you know, after having written the book and, and thinking about her in, in this sort of new perspective, I realized that that was a, that must have been a really hard thing for her to walk away from. Um, do you guys ever talk about it? Like her sort of rejection of it, why she decided to do that? My mom, you know, actually both of her sisters were very Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and actually like on her deathbed, my aunt who passed away, you know, begged my mother to go to the church and she didn't go. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think that she, I, she just had a weird, you know, she had her own set of beliefs. She like kind of believed in re reincarnation and she kind of just like, I, didn't, I think sh she was sort of like me. She didn't like rules and she didn't like that kind of pressure. And um, I think, I, you know, I remember her specifically saying after her sister had died, one of these, you know, she's like, I don't know how you could believe in, in God after something like this happens. Mm -hmm. And, um, her fr her friend who was a you know uh, her friend from the church was like oh that's the devil talking and that like was a real like all right we're done with yeah. this for her you know <laughs> um so yeah that was that was the closest we got to sort of talking about it but i you know it's like back then i just didn't think of her as like a full human being she was just my mom right. you know and i think a lot of uh kids go through that where you know when you're a teenager you just don't really see your parent in that way and so it wasn't really until afterwards that I sort of kind of investigating her uh, in this way and her character that I that I understood how um, how lonely of a decision that must have been and how uh, headstrong it, it must have been for her I mean it, seeing your parents as people is crazy um. <laughs> Because it, it, it's, it's, it's almost like the way you're describing it. It's like the first time you see a teacher at the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, what? Like, oh, what you're are not you supposed to be here? Yeah. Yeah. You belong in the school. Um, <laughs> but like even seeing her as a three-dimensional person in this way in, you know, posthumously, right? Like after she's passed away, like were there any conversations you had with your aunts about, or your aunt about like, her willfulness because the thing is like she moved right like that in and of itself is a very independent thing to marry an American also very independent these are all things that are rebellious in a Korean culture um, so like you know there are, seems to be some signs of it like her artistic bent did, did your aunt ever speak to that and yeah I mean these were again sort of things that I had maybe heard but never really believed, you know? I mean, I always knew my mom had this history of being the kind of tomboy of her family. She was like her dad's favorite and uh, she was very clumsy and very um, headstrong. And that was just impossible for me to wrap my head around because at home it, she felt so meticulous and so private and withholding and very composed and she, you know, liked, her clothes looked like they'd never been worn. Like, uh, you know, her leather was very nicely polished. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was just really hard for me to believe that um, growing up. And then I, you know, I've had some conversations with my aunt where I'll be like, oh, well, you know, she was so meticulous. And my aunt was like, no, she wasn't. <laughs> like we were the meticulous ones and she was the disaster. And it's so wild to think. And, and as I get older, I sort of see that in myself too, because I was also such a disaster. And as I, as I age, it's 
slowly coming together. And uh, I find myself, you know, taking pleasure in a lot of the same things that, that my mom, you know, were things that my mom enjoyed that I just never thought um, I would find an interest in. Um, can you just, like, give me an example? Well, for instance, like, I, you know, my mom uh, was very neat, and and I was so clumsy, and my father was also very clumsy, and so, you know, every time we would spill something on the carpet, you know, it would be like we had set it on fire, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> you know, she no one could touch it, you know. She had her, her method and her products, and you had to, like, dab it and not smear it, and... Yeah, I mean, I, and I just remember being like, it's not like I'm doing this on purpose. Like, don't <laughs> yell at me. Uh, I already feel bad about it. Right. And now, like, if my husband does that, I do the same <laughs> exact thing. <laughs> or, you know, like I could, like most Korean moms, she was like obsessed with sunscreen. And, you know, I oh couldn't, God, go, I couldn't yes. go anywhere without wearing a hat. And I didn't want to wear a hat. And I wanted to get tan. And, you know, she's always chasing me around with the SPF. And now, like, whenever <laughs> I, like, and with my husband, I also am like, we got to put on the sunscreen, you know? So just all the things that I thought um, I would never be into <laughs> are things that I, uh, I became just like my mother. I mean, sunscreen is uh, not a joke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, before we move on, I do want to ask you one, one, one last thing about your identity. Um, what do you see in yourself as like being very Korean now, like as you age? Like for me, it is my pettiness and rage. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, mine's very similar. Mine's like vengeance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, vengeance is, uh, looms very large in Korean culture. Yeah, I realize like at all of my success is rooted in vengeance. Like. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just as a reminder for kids, never let shit go. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you speak a little bit to that? Because I, I deeply identify. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, you know, just certain things that uh, I had, um, you know, just like exes who didn't believe that I would make it, uh, <laughs> opening, you know, performing with their favorite bands. Yeah. Uh, you know, it all just means way more when someone says, like, you can't do that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, actually, like, I, I, I definitely feel like I've inherited, like, uh, a real pettiness um, <laughs> from my mother. Uh, one of the things that I, I really struggled to try to put in the book but, but gave up on because it wasn't really a, a part of it, but was just so funny to me was my mom had this um, best friend named Youngsun who was like a Korean adoptee. And she had this German shepherd named Athena uh, and kind of like had hair dyed like a German shepherd. <laughs> so it was like gray and brown and black. And her eyebrows were tattooed really badly so it looked like she was always like quirking a brow. <laughs> And they were just kind of like this weird, odd couple for a while. They were like best friends for, for 15 years or something. And, you know, she was very bohemian and my mom was like kind of like bougie. And uh, they would always go to lunch. And, and one time our dog uh, was being babysat by her and they escaped the fence together. And Athena got hit by a car and my mom well, Youngsun was like, Youngsun kind of like, I think in her hurt, had this sort of misdirected anger towards my mom that was like, your dog did this, you know, like she led the, led the escape. The dog murdered? The well, yeah, that's what, that was what she was okay. saying. Okay. <laughs> but then my mom like was empty nester at this time and was just like, how dare you say this yeah. about my dog? My dog would never lead your dog. Your dog probably <laughs> led my dog out there. My dog was probably saying, let's stay in the, in the yard. And she never <laughs> talked to her again. And I swear to God, on her deathbed, my mom was like, don't let Youngsun come to the funeral. And the week that my mom died and her obituary ran in the paper, Youngsun called me crying, was like, I can't believe it, is it real? And I had to be like, it's a small family <laughs> funeral. I'm really sorry, it's private. And then I learned later that my 
grandmother did the same exact thing. And so I come from like a dynasty of like petty Korean women. <laughs> and I'm just wondering like which one of my friends is gonna be the one that I'm like, she's not coming. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just the idea of like oh, a bunch of middle-aged women arguing about what the dog said. <laughs> oh, gorgeous. Um, doing so much for the culture today. Uh, <laughs> um, you mentioned that you didn't include this in the book. I have to ask, like, what were some other memories that you were, like, kind of that came up that didn't make the cut? Like, what's a director's cut of the book sort of look like? Oh, uh, it's not good, you know. Uh, I mean, I can't remember exactly what else got sort of left on the the cutting room floor. I mean, and that was that was, you know, most of it was was left behind because it wasn't good or like I just you know was at my wits end in writing it and didn't really uh, want to take the time to figure out how to to weave it in. I mean, I I will say like I had a really hard time with the second chapter. The second chapter, like following up what ran as the essay in The New Yorker, um, was you know a tough sort of act to follow and I rewrote that like uh, quite a few times and I think it, it started um, much more about how my parents met and it had like my total, like my yeah. Korean first year birthday and it had um, a letter that my father had written to my mother. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I reworked, for, for some reason, the second chapter was really difficult for me to, to figure out for a while. Um, and there was a lot of sort of false starts. Um, can I ask what you picked at your tour? I picked the pencil. Oh! Uh, yeah, for those who don't know, your toll is like your Korean first year birthday. Because a lot of, uh, uh, like the, I don't know the correct historical way to describe this, but babies were dying before they reached a year old, and so once you like hit <laughs> yeah. a year old, uh, life used to be you sad. Were, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, but when you hit a year old, like you were kind of like, I guess Koreans were like, oh, we're home free, yeah. <laughs> like baby's gonna live, and uh, you had like a big celebration to to celebrate um, that milestone and one of the traditions is called your toll and like you stuff the baby in a little hanbok and um, you set out different objects. Uh, you have like money and like thread and um, a pencil, like some people do like a gavel and whatever the, po uh, the baby sort of crawls um, and grabs is supposed to like predict their profession. And so, the second chapter began with like uh, me picking the pencil as like a you know self-proclaimed scholar that you know yes. ended up writing this book. So it, it, it works. Clearly. It works. Yeah. <laughs> what did you pick? What did you I? Pick, pick? You picked. Uh, no, I I I picked. The, um, I also picked the pencil. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> sort of. I was trying to figure out like what you would. No, my, my son actually uh, picked the microphone. There, you put a microphone? Yeah, that's like the new trendy thing to put out. <laughs> and, and when my son picked it, my mom was horrified. <laughs> and then kept going up to all the guests being like, it also means he could be a politician. <laughs> so, don't worry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, don't worry, I'm gonna love my son correctly. Um, <laughs> Like, so in the, uh, when you're describing the second chapter and stuff, like, and you describe when you decide to move back, when you find out your mother's diagnosis, I, cause I was kind of curious, like, what was the status of your relationship at that point? Um, like, had the reconciliation, had, had it begun? And do you think the trajectory of your reconciliation would have been different if she hadn't gotten sick? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, the one part that was really heartbreaking about when she died, I mean, I, there's never a good time for your mom to die, but, um, you know, I think what was so heartbreaking was that it was, it was sort of around the time that things had just started getting good, you know, and, and, and the time that we had together where things were starting to get really beautiful and we were able to sort of speak to each other as peers and as friends and sort of see each other uh, the way that we wanted to be seen for the first time, uh, was very short-lived, you know. 
my mom uh, and I sort of started begin beginning to reconcile. I mean, I, we were we had a tumultuous relationship, but we were very devoted to one another. And I think that part of why I wanted to write this book was to really prove that. You know, I think that from the outside, people probably felt like we maybe didn't have a great relationship all the time. And and for me, it was just important to show that we were very close. It was just complicated. You know, we were just at odds with one another. And um, but yeah, I mean, th that kind of stuff became easier once I went to college. You know, I think part of it was her being like, "Okay, my job is done. She's mm -hmm. out of the house. I did all I could." Um, and you know, not being so on top of each other. And I think it was also me realizing once I was out of the house, just like how charmed uh, of a childhood and an upbringing I had of having this dedicated homemaker as a mother who loved me very much and all the things that I had to do for myself all of a sudden that I really took for granted and so we were really already beginning to kind of reconcile with one another um, but you know the wounds were of you know my adolescence were still kind of fresh and sort of why she initially didn't want me to, to come home. I mean that was sort of my first thought like when I was asking about the reconciliation and the trajectory of that because your immediate response being so um, devoted and the idea that you wanted to be the perfect daughter for her was so, that transition was very immediate. And you know, the moment where you're in the airport cleaning everything off of yourself to project that image that she thought, you thought that she wanted to see. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that the transition was so immediate made me feel like you guys had probably started the transition to being more, um, close, but like, you know, I was just wondering about like that process of forgiveness, not only just being outside of the house, but like once you realize she was sick, how rapid does that process, how rapidly does that process start? And is it still happening? Mm. You know, like, you know, even the wounds that you're describing because of the way that your, because your mother got sick, like there is sort of like a, an arrested development with regards to the relationship. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, wh like, what is your relationship with your mother's memory now? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure because she passed when I was still pretty young, you know, I really um, romanticized things that I absolutely <laughs> hated about her <laughs> when I was growing up, you know? I mean, she was, uh, she could be very cruel. I mean, she was very judgmental and very critical, um, and it was exhausting and, and you know, uh, heartbreaking and, and hurtful, um, and I, I hated those things uh, about her growing up, and now uh, that she's gone, I, I long for that brutal honesty, you know? I mean, I, I think that if she was alive, we would continue to butt heads and, and still have that sort of push and pull. Um, but I think because she she passed so early, I find myself, um, you know, like it's it's kind of bad. Like all, all of these like negative qualities I sort of inherited from her. I, you know, I, if she had been alive, I'd be like, oh God, I don't want to be just like my mother. And now that she is gone, I'm like, oh, that's you, mom. Like, uh, so like if I'm like being really petty or like passing judgment in a really mean way, it's like instead of being like, I should really work on that, I should improve myself, I'm like, that's like, you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me ask so you. it just <laughs> turned me into a terrible person. <laughs> well, I, this thing is like, I understand, there was this moment where like, so when I was young, my mom loved to lie to my dad um, about everything. She, we would lie about like how much money we spent, where we went, <laughs> like all the time. Toxic. Um, so like, in, you know, you're talking about romanticizing your mother now in memory, but like, what are some lessons you learned from her, perhaps that you are trying to let go? You know, because um, you know, I don't think anyone here thinks their parents are perfect. You should leave if you do. Uh, <laughs> but like, you know, like, what have you tried to unlearn, perhaps? Like, do you withhold 10% still? Yeah, I mean, I do think that that is really good advice. I mean, um, and that could mean just like hiding money in the house, you know? Um, I believe in that. Uh, things that I, I mean, I do think like when I have a kid, I will not raise them, uh, I hope, you know? I, I, I won't raise, I mean, I, I will take a lot of, a lot from her and, and uh, her parenting and I'm, I'm sure I will, 
take it, uh, like, I'm sure some of it will be, like, beyond my control of, like, what I inherited from her parenting style. Yeah. But I also think that, you know, because I was able to do something with my life that was very unrealistic uh, and creative, um, I've seen that that can happen, you know? I've seen proof that that, like, I, I, that can, is possible, you know? And I think that all along my mom was just trying to protect me because she just didn't believe that it was and that she felt that that was something, um, that was her duty to protect me from an unrealistic uh, path and goal and, you know, financial and emotional strife. And so I think that that's something I will definitely have unlearned by the time I raise my own kid is that, you know, I, I will, I think, I would like to believe that I would, I'll be more open about what, you know, what direction they want to take. But I'm sure when the time comes, I'll also be a nightmare in my own <laughs> special way. I mean, I, I very much agree. Like, I, I thought that I would be just as, um, supportive of my son's delusions, but my son wants to become a, a ninja, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know anybody in the ninja industry. Uh, <laughs> I wanna end you this. You won't be a Nepo ninja? Nepo ninja. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, in the chapter about your wedding that you felt it would be impossible to feel beautiful without your mother's approval. Like, really underlying that. Um, can I ask how you feel beautiful now? Like, and if you f still feel that need? Whoa. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, I think I, I really yearn for that brutal honesty. And I don't think it's something I'll ever have again. You know, and I think I knew that. Um, sometimes, like, I'll really push Peter to just be like, tell me I'm not working hard enough. Like, <laughs> please. And he's like, you, you're doing great. I'm like, that's not what I need right now. Um, I think that I just really yearn for that kind of, like, stern, um, you know, like, I just always want to, uh, to, like, seek an approval or, like, I'm looking for something that's, like, always, with, like, you know, beyond my grasp. I think, in a way, like, uh, part of my ambition comes from, like, constantly trying to make someone proud that's not here anymore. Um, and so, in that way, yeah, I mean, I think, weirdly, like, I, maybe I, like, feel the most beautiful when I'm successful. <laughs> Which is like a very Korean <laughs> that's thing. The fun, that's the most Korean thing. <laughs> when I've conquered my revenge. <laughs> when the Vengeance trilogy is complete, I feel the most beautiful. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, as I was reading this, I kept, uh, like, some, um, Joan, Di Joan Didion's uh, yeah. Year of Magical Thinking yeah. kept coming. Um, I don't know if you guys know that book, but it is the uh, Liberal Dummies Guide uh, to Death. And um, <laughs> she... <laughs> you can find it in that section. It's yellow with the... Exactly. You know. <laughs> and it says, for BFAs only. <laughs> um, and Joan, Joan in, in, uh, in her book, Year of Magical Thinking, she wrote... Um, I could not count the times during the average day when something would come up that I needed to tell him. And this impulse did not end with his death. Can you tell me something that you find yourself wanting to tell your mom? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's mostly just like, look at this. <laughs> 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 I got nominated for a Grammy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but then I just remember she'd probably be like, well, it's not like it's record of the year. <laughs> it's not like you won. <laughs> she'd probably be like, what's a Grammy? Yeah. <laughs> um, so let me ask, like, then at this point inside of your grief and your mourning, like, wh how old is your grief? Like, is it a toddler? Is it throwing tantrums? <laughs> is it irrational? Is it a teenager, like, morose and sleeping a lot? Or is it an adult, like, living on its own? Um, wow. It's like therapy. Um, <laughs> Everything else is about farts, don't worry. Okay, great. 
I mean, if we're counting like the actual years it's been, it's nine going on nine years old. So I mean, I guess it's a kid, but I don't know if it's like a dog year situation. <laughs> Um, I mean, it doesn't feel like a nine-year-old. Like, it has more sense than that, okay. I think. Um, I think it feels adult. I mean, I, I, it's not, you know, I, I don't, like, enjoy not having a mother, but I do um, enjoy the grief that I feel for her when I feel it because I feel like I had a real love in my life and when um, I experience that loss uh, and I have a good cry, um, it's something that I can be grateful for and value. Um, whereas when it was a younger grief, uh, it felt like an impossible thing that I would never um, recover from. And so it doesn't feel that way anymore and it's still uh, hard, but it's not like temperamental, it feels very, it feels mature. It feels like it, it, it knows what it's doing and, and where it's going. It's like a precocious 12 year old. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. I mean, do you think the process of kind of reliving it and talking about it a lot, it helped or did it like kind of slow down your rela you know, relationship with getting over it? I think it helped, you know, I mean like, I, I mean, yeah, I think it did help. I think it was the only way that I was ever going to make sense of it, really. For sure. Um, and I, and I, that was a big, you know, part of writing this book was just, you know, making sense of this shocking thing that happened so quickly. You know, my mom got sick, and six months later she was dead, and my nuclear family was had fallen apart, and everything I had thought I had known about my life was, you know, sort of altered, and... It took many years of like processing that through writing uh, to get a grasp on on how to feel about it and what even went down. Um, and I think you know, as as a creative person, it just was always going to be the way that I I needed to to handle it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it was helpful. I mean, one really beautiful part of writing. A, a memoir is that you have to have this kind of like radical empathy, f not only for the people who are uh, characters in the book, but for yourself too. You know, I realized in uh, the many iterations of, of editing this book um, how angry I was at, at everyone uh, involved, and including myself. And I think that I realized in order to tell. Um, an honest and compelling story that that's like not the vibe that you have to <laughs> <laughs> that you have to play fair and you have to really examine um, your own bad behavior and its source and um, you know the, the background and and paths of people involved to make poor decisions and and also exhibit bad behavior what in their life led them to make those decisions and what they were feeling and what they were running from and so it was really you know you have to really embody um, those people in order to make a, f a story that you feel is fair and true and so part of that also was like letting go of a lot of anger and shame I had uh, towards myself of just you know um, really regretting being such a difficult teenager um, and really understanding why uh, we were so at odds with one another. And I sort of came to realize we had no real reference point for what we were up against. I mean, we were from two, we were raised in two very different cultures and two very different generations. Um, we were two very different people and, and we had no um, friends that had uh, that, that kind of relationship. I didn't have any friends who had an immigrant parent that, were, that was sort of going through that. Um, I didn't have anything in the media that would give me any idea uh, that that might be challenging and, and why beyond just us as, as individuals. Um, and so yeah, I think in writing this book and, and thinking about all those things, I, I kind of was able to to move on in, in a way and, and really forgive things that were difficult for me to forgive. Oof. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that is me I was really struck with like your own shame about your own behavior during your teenage years. Like, which, I mean, did, none of you guys are ashamed of yourselves for doing your <laughs> teens. Um, but, you know, when you're describing like the radical empathy that you're able to exhibit towards yourself through writing this, do you, 
is that still a part of your grieving today, or do you think it's something that you've compartmentalized <laughs> and put away? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think it's probably. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess it's still. It's still something I I I deal with every day. Yeah. Does kimchi help? <laughs> does kimchi help? Yeah, I, it does. Um, I mean, I think like for a secular person in the mm -hmm. modern age, um, we don't have much to lean on when it comes to these like huge ideas that go beyond human comprehension. Um, and so I think that to find these kind of small practices and, and rituals is sort of the closest that we have to, um, and astrology, you know? Uh, <laughs> I feel like that's like like contemporary religion is like there are these like weird sort of guidelines to sort of anchor yourself during a difficult time uh, or to describe like something that feels um, beyond describing. Uh, so I, I think for me, like making and eating kimchi, it, it, it feels like a private ritual. Like it's it is. It sounds so cheesy, but, it, you know, it's almost like a prayer. You know, you yeah. have in, in the sense that you have a you have a, it's a quiet internal moment mm -hmm. to reflect on someone at something. Um, and I think that in a way that was a, a type of like pra spiritual practice as close as I was, I was gonna get to, uh, to something like that. And I that's mean, a very yeah. a Korean efficient mind where it's like, if you're gonna have a <laughs> spiritual moment, you better like be getting fed, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, I think that food is incredibly healing. I mean, that's the reason why all of us are making sourdough, you know? Um, <laughs> There is something very healing about food, very specifically. And, you know, when you're describing, I was struck because you not only look to making kimchi, but you also started making pizza right after. Like, there's something very, you know what I mean? Very, something very much closely tied to not only the act of cooking. That was definitely not a therapeutic uh, <laughs> type of pizza making, though, I will say. But it was like, what do you think it is very specifically about your history with food? Um, you describe your the fact your parents weren't culturally sophisticated, but that they were very worldly with regard to taste. I will say, I think you're particularly attuned to something though, because you described hanyak in a way that I never like. You described it as like fernet. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was like, well, correct. Yeah. I, I mean, it truly took my breath away. The, I put the my, Chinese tea. The Chinese. It's like yeah. it's a it's a medicinal herbal, medicinal tea that's yeah. like made from twigs and uh like which it's is disgusting it's so gross um and it was crazy because like i i used to drink this tea when i was younger because my mom <laughs> was worried i was too short uh and so like maybe if i didn't drink the tea i'd be like four eight or something but uh yeah i mean i had to drink like a giant Oh my gosh. Like also one of these of like uh, yes, you yeah, have to. one I of mean, these and then years later when I got a job in the service industry uh, the bartender's like oh we're all doing shots of fernet and I took the shot and I was like what this sound, this tastes exactly like yeah. this oriental tea you know <laughs> I mean so I, I just think you're predisposed to it do you think there's like something like is it something else in your family like are you attuned to it is everyone in your family sort of culinarily like inclined cuz like I, I would never have thought of that, you know, like Hanyak is, it's also, by the way, I was just realizing this as you're talking about you were, your mom gave it to you because you were short. My mom gave it to me because I was, um, my, my skin and uh, attitude was bad. <laughs> I was like, like <laughs> if there's anybody here that's been taking Hanyak, you know, your parents like give it to you, it's a remedy, a very specific thing yeah, that's wrong yeah. with you. It's a cure-all. <laughs> exactly. Um, but like, but do you, is there something? <laughs> is there something else? Like I, I just was really struck with like the language around food because it's you know incredibly vivid, and you also have the, the fortune of being sort of an outsider. Like there are things that you were noticing about the ambidextrous way that Ajima is like cut naengmyeon and stuff like that. I would never have even realized. And there's such a gift there because not only are you very close to everything, but you're able to have a certain amount of distance to observe. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I think may make you like more intimately attuned to what's happening to mm -hmm. the culture, you know? Um, 
yeah, I just like that was something that I really w was noting as I was reading. I was like, shit, she noticed everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. That, that's very sweet. Um, I think you know maybe it has something to do with being mixed. Is that you are this you know so you have this real outsider perspective and um, you're able to. Ha feel kind of like simultaneously a part and not a part of something and, and are kind of tuned into these details. Um, I think, you know, my mom, I, I don't know how much of this is romanticizing my mother or how much of it is really true, but I, I do feel like my mother was a very detail-oriented person with, with, you know, an artistic sensibility and eye and that if she had grown up um, in a different, like, time and culture that she might have... <clears throat> followed a path that was that was maybe a little bit more creative and found her voice in that um, because you know I'll, sometimes like when people like pick up on a line in the book or something you know that isn't it, it is her character I mean she had this like very like artistic sensibility about the way that she phrased things she was deeply moved by you know just ordinary interactions and and I feel like she told a good story I mean she had a very like social magnetic personality and was a good storyteller in, in that way um, and so, yeah, I mean, she would always, she taught me to love um, through those kinds of details. And so I, I'm one of those people that obsessively remembers, like, who's gluten-free and, like, who doesn't eat dairy and who likes, you know, seafood and who doesn't eat that. Um, because that was sort of what my, I remember friends would come over and my mom would be like, oh, Corey, she doesn't eat anything, you know. Uh, she's the picky one. The greatest one. offense, yeah. Yeah, and, um, yeah, I mean, I just remember I went out with my husband's, friend and his wife and we were eating noodles and at one point sh she looked to her husband and was like do you like cilantro and I was just like what <laughs> like how do you not know that like I know I can go to a restaurant and I know exactly what my like if we've never been there I know exactly what my husband is gonna order just so I know his tastes really well um and yeah I think I was just sort of trained um it's like nunchi, you know. I just yes. like I feel like it's it's exactly just having it the sensibility of um, people's comfort around you, and so I I had like a, I was just raised with that kind of sensibility. Nunchi is like. Yeah. Do you want to explain what that no, is? You explain. <laughs> I've been providing many definitions. <laughs> <laughs> it's I already it's did totally. So yeah. yeah. Uh, nunchi is a Korean idea of like just being able to assess a social situation. So you pick up on someone's being, if they're feeling uncomfortable or, you know, or someone who has a lot of power in a room, it does go back to vengeance. Like, it's kind of like, who's going <laughs> to... Because you want to be able to read a room. That's basically what it is, the ability to read a room. And it's a very specific skill that is highly prized in Korean culture. And so, like, your mom sounds like she had incredible nunchi mm. and that you do as well, you know? Um, can I ask, before we kind of wrap up for the Q&A, um, what is something, uh, so there's another Korean idea, idea called jung, which is like love that goes into food. Is there a specific dish that no matter how you try, you can never get the kind of jung that your mother had in something? <laughs> that person's feeling some jung for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I don't even really... I mean, there's a lot, you know? I mean, there's just, uh, I could, I don't think I can make anything the same sure. way and it's endlessly, I don't even think I can make rice the way <laughs> my mom made it. It's crazy um, though, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, you know, the meal that my, my mom would always make kalbi, which is like the Korean short rib barbecue. Um, and I don't even like try, honestly, because I just know that it'll taste like <laughs> shit compared to like what she, what she made, um, and yeah, it's a weird thing that I, I I never really make it at home, and I think it's because I just know it's gonna it's gonna fall so flat. <laughs> it'll be a um, disappointment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, oh yeah, I mean, I think that <sighs> there's so many things like that. I mean, is that the dish that you miss the most that your mom made? Um, maybe. I mean, I think it's like a set meal. You know, it was, she would always do like kalbi. And then like kimchi jjigae and they were, like the certain types of banchan that she would make. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, it's hard to pick one, you know. I just sort of, I miss, I miss it all really. Yeah. That's great. Um, I think we're ready to move to the, uh, so we'll just thank you very much for this thank conversation. Thank you. <laughs> A 
Okay, so we're going to start the Q&A. Um, we'll start on this side over here. I didn't think I was going to be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michelle, uh, you got the music, you also got the memoir, and you got the last thing I was going to make a joke on. Anyway, <laughs> when's the menu? When are you going to put out the cookbook? Oh, um... <laughs> the movie, that's what it was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't really have a real desire to, to make a, a cookbook, honestly, because I, a lot of the Korean dishes that I make, I feel like are just uh, very traditional, and I don't really have my own voice or, like, style. I think maybe, like, my, my pipe dream is, like, when I'm, like, in my 60s or something, I have like one of those old lady restaurants that seats like 12 people. Uh, and my like industrious ass like can't sit down and just like has to be working all the time. I really want to start like a chun makuli bar oh, where I yes. just like make like little pancakes for uh, 12 lucky people yeah. a night. And so that's like my retirement plan. But I don't, I don't think, I don't know if there will ever be a cookbook from me. But thank you. Who knows? So you mentioned a while ago in an interview that you were inspired a lot by Bjork and Nine Inch Nails. So I wanted to ask. That's right, I have good taste. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to ask what's your favorite Nine Inch Nails song? Um, I guess, what was I, uh, what is it, March of the Pigs, is that, is that the one? Yeah, had like a whole, like, you know, the hits. Sorry if that's really basic. I don't have any like <laughs> Nine Inch Nails deep cuts to share. B-sides of Nine Inch yeah, Nails. Yeah, Nine Inch Nails, yeah. B-sides. Trent's mad. Yeah. I love the Social Network soundtrack. Yeah, exactly. I was gonna track, say, all the soundtrack work, eight. yeah. <laughs> The soundtrack work. <laughs> the scene where he's getting sued. Love that song. <laughs> Good job, Atticus. <laughs> okay, anyone over on the uh, left side of the room? Uh, one question I had is kind of about your relationship to nature. I don't know like how much that's really played a role. Like I feel like you have in your songwriting and in your book, you deal with like this interpersonal space and relationships with like so much texture and it's just so rich. So I'm just wondering as like a creative, if um, like nature plays a role in kind of like what as an artist you relate to in nature. Wow, thank you. Um, that's a really lovely question. It's funny because, um, you know, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I grew up in, uh, yeah, in Eugene, Oregon. And I also grew up kind of um, outside of town in the woods. Uh, and I had, you know, we grew up in like a, five acres and there were no neighbors. And it was very isolating upbringing, but it was very beautiful and majestic. And I, and I attribute a lot of like my creative brain and like imagination, I think, to just having to spend so much time alone um, outside. And so I think, yeah, I mean, but in the same breath, like, I fucking hate hiking. Um, and I'm just, like, not one of those people at all. So, like, I mostly just like to enjoy nature from inside. Um, but I, I do really love, uh, like, you know, I, I, this book tour sort of started in, in Seattle and made its way to Oregon. And, you know, there is that specific type of nature that really kind of takes my breath away and I enjoy being in it for like limited periods of time. <laughs> but I do, I, I do feel very moved by it, you know, and I do think a lot of my writing is sort of um, about that because I think maybe I associate a lot of my childhood to that. Like I remember, you know, I, I, I have at least like five songs that reference like burn piles, which was just like when my father and I would, you know, break down the brush outside and like burn blackberry bramble and like that, to me is just like such a, um, yeah, like bucolic Im image, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it does, it simultaneously plays, I, I find you know, myself to be most creative, like kind of in, in the woods and in isolation and, and in that similar sort of environment, but from inside. 
looking out a window. Yeah, you, you're like a yurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not you, I don't even think I could handle a yurt. I know, I know somebody that lives in a yurt. <laughs> He's weird. <laughs> Sorry. Is this all? Nobody else wanted to talk. No. <laughs> ask a question. I, I have a question. Um, I wanted to ask you, because I was very surprised in the book how honest you were on your relationship with your dad and just mentioning the good and the bad. And I wanted to ask you like, how hard was that part? And yeah, like how do you came to the decision? Like, I'm gonna be honest about things because when you write a memoir, like you also know that the people that you're mentioning are probably going to read this and it's going to have like an impact in your personal life. And was just interested on that and how is like your relationship now with your dad? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was one of the hardest parts of the book to write um, because I didn't want, mostly because I didn't want to bring shame to my mom. My dad is a real open book of a guy and would have told any stranger, I think, uh, the things that are mentioned in the book. Um, it's funny, like, I sent him a copy of the book uh, before it came out, and uh, I don't think he read it until, until later, and, you know, I, I was really nervous about it, but ultimately I felt if I could just portray him in all, you know, similar to my mom and to myself and to everyone involved it, with all of their flaws and all of their attributes, like, if I was able to create as fair of a portrait as possible, then, it, you know, how could anyone be upset? That was, that was how I feel. And it's really funny the things that people get upset about. Uh, you know, it was for my dad, it was not like the infidelity or, or uh, the drinking or sort of checking out during an important time. It was uh, that he sold new cars to the military <laughs> and not used <laughs> ones, yeah. And, you know, it was just a detail that I misremembered. Um, and, and, you know, it, in my mind, it was, I, I really admired that about him, that he, he had this sort of, he had a very um, traumatic childhood and a very difficult life, and he overcame um, a lot in his life. And he sort of found his footing uh, in this job overseas, and uh, it, in a very humble job, I felt. And I thought that, you know, selling used cars was, was a kind of funny thing to, like, be very proud of, um, but I admired that about him. Uh, and yeah, that was the one thing that he was really pissed about. And so in the paperback, actually, we took it out. Um, so <laughs> that's the only change, like, in the paperback. Really? Now it says car salesman, not used car salesman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there another one? Is there anything you can tell us about new music you're working on? Um. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm currently writing. I don't know, it, it, I'm not really writing. Um, <laughs> I've written some songs. I, I wanted to record them this year. I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, this movie, this goddamn movie, has uh, really sucked me in. Um, initially, I was like, I don't want to, I don't really want to write it, and they're like, you're gonna write it. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, but I'm, I'll supervise the soundtrack, but I don't really want to score it. And they're like, you're gonna score it. You're scoring so, it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> you're Trent Reznor. Yeah, I'm Trent Reznor now. You are Trent Reznor. Um, yeah, so I think I'm gonna be pretty busy with that uh, this year, for better or for worse. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm dying to make another record, and as soon as I, I have free time, I'm, I'm really ready to go. Yeah. But I, it might not be for a while, so. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> oh my god, I'm actually talking to you. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> okay, first things first, when you say like vengeance, it's like the secret to your success. Yes, girl, yes. My <laughs> ex told me I was a very bad writer, and now I am doing a PhD in literature in yeah. a very similar ranked school as him. <laughs> so
so yeah, I get it. Uh, but my question goes to like a different direction. And something that I do in my PhD is I read a lot about motherhood and daughterhood. And honestly, reading your book was really nice because I don't feel we talk about being a daughter that much. So it was great. But most specifically, what my research focus is like the relationship and like the identifications between daughter with their mothers, which is something you were talking just a minute ago. And I was wondering if you could tell us maybe a little bit about the process of recognizing yourself in your mother and recognizing your mother in yourself. Like, how did that go? Like, what did you feel? Because, I mean, I've been through that process and it truly created like mixed emotions to me, but I don't know how it was for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and congratulations on your yeah. PhD. Fuck that guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, when I, I was younger, I mean, I always felt like I, I took after my, my father um, when I was younger, because we're both um, really aggro and um, very open book kind of people. And I always, um, really admired but also was terrified by my mom's ability to be sort of private and withholding. It was very um, magnetic quality about her and something I just couldn't relate to at all. But yeah, I mean, I, I think I see her in me um, so much more as I get older. Um, I think the way that I, I interact with people and, and my sort of social tendencies are, are very much like my mother's. And I think, yeah, like I said, I, I, you know, I don't know how much of it is really me romanticizing her after she's passed, but I do believe that, um, you know, my father was, it's, it's not really a creative guy. I mean, he's a really ambitious uh, man, but I don't think he's very, I don't think I, I get any kind of creative sensibility from him. And so, I think you always wonder where that sort of comes from in your family, and as I get older, the more I feel like that comes from my mother's side, and from her in particular. I, I do think that um, the way that I observe people and I'm impacted by ordinary, mundane things are sort of the way that um, she, she did. So, you know, I think that the reason why I maybe never noticed that was because it was a more like subtle, nuanced um, similarity. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a really beautiful thing that makes me feel close to her. And it's very exciting now when I kind of discover parts of, parts of her in me. We have a question back here. Hi, um, I also lost my mom in my 20s to cancer, so I just wanted to hear about your experience communicating with like other people your age who had never really gone through that sort of grief because even if they had it was probably like a grandparent or you know someone much older and probably not like a parent. So how did you communicate with like your loved ones your age and tell them what you were going through? Yeah. Um, that's a great question and I'm I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, you know, I think a big reason why I wrote this book was because I really couldn't. Um, I felt very, uh, I'm, you know, I, I, like I, I'm a very social person and I'm like very open book and chatty. And so I was, I was really shocked by how um, quiet of an experience my grief was. I felt uh, really unable to, to express how I was feeling, maybe partially because it was just shock and not knowing exactly how I was feeling. But I also felt, you know, just so alone and um, relating to people who, you know, would try uh, and fail <laughs> to relate to me in that sort of experience. So I, I think a big reason why I, I was drawn to writing this book and, and making albums about the experience was just this way of trying to express how I feel felt in, in that moment. and. So much of this book, in a way, is about um, just, I just didn't feel like anyone could comprehend like what I had seen and what I had gone through and how it had felt. And it was, um, part of it was just kind of like an explanation of, of that. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, if you're going through it, I, I, I highly recommend like r writing about that experience. You know, a lot of the stuff that I wrote about grief felt really stupid uh, at the time. And a lot of those, 
lines that felt really dumb. You know, one of the lines was like, uh, my grief feels like I'm in a room with no doors. Uh, and I felt really dumb when I wrote that, but I was like, I think it kind of makes sense. And I find that so many people actually quote that line back to me uh, who have gone through that experience. And so uh, I, I recommend to anyone who's um, sort of struggling with, with trying to relate to people after something like that, this has happened, um, it, to write about that experience and, and all of the, uh, the funny, weird, stupid details because it, um, it's, it was very healing for me and yeah. We have time for one more question. Hi, um, congrats on the paperback and the book tour. And I guess belate, happy belated birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so now you have experience in writing your memoir and also writing the screenplay. I guess I was just curious, what are the commonalities that you find um, storytelling between these two very different forms? And what is the biggest, the hardest thing that you had to um, work on for the screenplay? Sure, yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think that the sort of, uh, what's similar is, um, I guess, like, uh, pathos, you know, of just what um, felt, I, I feel like my job, uh, or maybe what I'm good at is, is um, being moved by, like, the seemingly mundane or ordinary, um, and, and finding uh, those sort of moments in, in everyday interaction. Um, you know, when my mom said I'd never met anyone like you, there's nothing complicated about those words. You know, there's no like interesting yeah. vocabulary, but uh, you know, it, it's such a poetic way to express um, such a big idea. Uh, and so it's about kind of like finding those moments um, and, and, and placing them, I guess, in, in a moving way and having an idea of, of, of how to bring out emotion and, and yourself and in other people. Um, I would say uh, the biggest difference is I, in writing a book, I've never felt stupider. And in writing a screenplay, I've never felt less funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's just get out your artist way, guys. Um, get to chapter three. Um, I, I, before we end, I do have one last question for you. It is a fuck, Mary kill. Oh, great, I love <laughs> Um Fuck, Mary kill, kimchi jjigae, karbi tang, shin ramen. Oh, wow. I would definitely marry kimchi jjigae. <laughs> uh, and I think I have to fuck shin ramen. Yes, you know? like, that's spicy. Like, that's, a, that's like a one night stand that's right. kind of meal. It's, it's, it's hot and it's dirty. <laughs> and you're not going to feel good afterward. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank Great. you Thanks. guys. <laughs>